If you have one available at home, you can join us and light your candle. This one's low, but it's definitely present. And we offer the presence of Christ. Also, as I pour this water, I pour it as we remember our baptism into life and service with Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, welcome to worship today at New Covenant Fellowship. I am the Reverend Sally Watson from Mission Presbytery. I have been with you before, and it's good to be back with you again today, this Transfiguration Sunday. Um, let us join together our hearts and minds in worship. Amen. This is a day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad, and glad in it. it. Please join me with the call to worship. This call and response so everybody gets to participate. Let us go up to the mountain. Let's go up to the place where the land meets the sky. Where the earth touches the heavens. In the place of meeting. The place of mist. To the place of voices and conversations. To the place of listening. We go to see the glory of the Lord and be transformed. Amen. And now, please um, join me in our prayer of adoration. Give your praises to God in your own way. Eternal God, I come before you with words of praise. I seek to worship you and draw closer to you. You are worthy of praise. You created the heavens and the earth and all that are contained within. Thank you for your mighty acts in creation. I give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, for his ministry of teaching and healing, for showing me the way to a better life, for providing me with a way with you, and for the promise of eternal life. Oh God, you are so gracious. In your great mercy, you provide me with all I need. I take joy in the abundance of your bounty. In the manner in which you care for creation, I pray I will always follow your ways, that your presence will shelter me, for you are my rock and my redeemer, my hiding place and my strong tower. Thank you, O oh God, for loving me. Amen. 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 So now let's say our mission statement together. You come to the fellowship, this is a racially diverse community, informed by the Bible, empowered by the Holy Spirit and motivated to share God's love with all. In response to God's love, we are called to equip disciples to faithfully serve, to encourage seekers to joyfully commit, and to move of all to worship our Lord as we love our neighbors, grow in grace, and live by faith. Now we're going to enjoy the hymn, Morning Has Broken. In the transfiguration story, Jesus' clothes became dazzling white, a sign of resurrection out of the violence of the world inflicted upon him. Resurrection reminds us that the sins of the world and of our lives will not have the last word. God's love, compassion, and justice will be established on earth. So let us confess God confess before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of, con of confession. Merciful God, God, even when we see your justice transfigured before us, power in fear of following your way in the world, we wonder what it might us to walk along the way of Jesus. Help us to listen. Empower us to be formed by the light of Jesus Christ. Restoring us the confidence to be disciples of Christ. Amen. Now take a minute to lift your private and personal silent confessions. Amen. 
know, just as a cloud overshadowed the disciples in the transfiguration story. And they heard a voice said that Jesus is the beloved son of God. So too are we God's beloved people. Be forgiven and restored to our right standing as God's beloved. Now I invite you to unmute yourselves online as we extend God's grace to one another and share that peace we've been given by greeting each other with the word. The peace of Christ be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Yeah, thanks for God. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace. Kathy. Hi. I can't see anybody, but peace of Christ to you too. Now what pressure was saying? You and you and you. And Jesus Christ, Peace of Christ, Kathy. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Do you like blue? Do you like my mom? Okay. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, also with you. now we wait for thee ready our God thy will to see open our hearts our minds illumine us spirit divine in Jesus name we ask it amen, amen. friends our first scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew's gospel it is indeed the story of the transfiguration so listen now for the word that God has for us this day Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings, one for here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them saying, get up and do not be afraid. Um, our Old Testament lesson is actually from the New Testament. This is Second Peter, the second letter of Peter, the first chapter beginning with verse 16. Listen again for God's word. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. 
We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. like your topic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, if y'all need to move your chairs to see me, ladies, that's fine. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So this story that the church has come to refer to as the transfiguration is one of the most formative episodes in the Christian faith. It gets written up in three out of the four gospels. Compare that with Jesus's birth, which we probably think of as a lot more formational but it is covered in only two of the Gospels. It's a lot easier for us to get our heads around the idea of a baby and a mom and a dad and a variety of barnyard animals than it is for us to begin to fathom Jesus glowing like a light bulb and having a conversation with two guys who came back from the grave. When you think about it, everybody gets born. Anybody could have been born in a manger but not everybody has their holiness revealed to the faithful and gets to hear God confirm it. Theologians have argued over the last 2,000 years about whether Jesus was fully human or fully divine or a combination of both. The Christian story by itself can't give us that answer. The transfiguration is one of those moments in scripture where we first get to see that Jesus is so much more than just some really good human or a trickster who can use sleight of hand or even just some old fashioned good luck to cure people and turn water into wine. This is the first time since Jesus' baptism that the curtain between heaven and earth is parted and the lights come on as it were and God speaks and we get to see Jesus in a way that we have never seen him before. Usually, we pair this reading from Matthew up with a reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, where Moses goes to the mountain for a meeting with God and comes down with his very own shiny face. That makes for an interesting Old Testament tie-in to help us understand some of that tradition. But when you pair this reading from Matthew up with our reading from 2 Peter, It gives the transfiguration a whole nother dimension. Peter testifies that he was a witness, that he saw the whole thing with his own eyes. And then he goes on to say something very puzzling. He says, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. Is Peter reflecting on his own actions when he says that? Or maybe, just maybe, he is saying to us that we can't just make whatever we want to out of what God brings to pass through the Holy Spirit. Transfiguration is not one of those words that we come across in our regular everyday vocabulary, is it? It is too long a word for scramble. And it is not exactly something that happens every day. Maybe you remember from reading the Harry Potter books. Got any Harry Potter readers here? Harry Potter, those books go on to say that the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry has to take a course in transfiguration. Did you know that? That is the course that teaches them how to change teacups into rats or how to change flowers into candles. And that probably isn't far off from what most of us think when we hear that word. We hear the word transfiguration as a change of state from one thing into another. The Greek word for it, though, is the same one that gives us the word 
metamorphosis. And that's a word that also conjures up the idea of caterpillars turning into butterflies, or for those of you who enjoy reading Franz Kafka, the idea of waking up one day to discover you have been turned into a giant beetle. But what sets the transfiguration of Jesus apart from fictional fantasy or even from quantifiable biology is this. Jesus didn't really change, did he? Those 2,000 years of theology have taught us that the humanness of Jesus coexisted right along with his divine nature. It wasn't like he could toggle between the two whenever he felt like it. It was more the case that something that had been part of Jesus all along was displayed that day in a different way. That's important for us to remember because in those times when Jesus said things like, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He wasn't just talking about this one particular and rather showy episode of his life. He meant that his divinity was on display every day of his life. When he spoke kindly to ostracized women and outcast lepers, when he wept over a dead friend, and when he smiled at a misguided but earnest rich young ruler, he was God in flesh the whole time. What this also tells us on the verge of Lent is that the glory of God, the creator, and the fullness of God in three persons was on display when Jesus was given a crown of thorns and hoisted up on the cross. Maybe that's always why, that's why we always mark Transfiguration Sunday on the Sunday before we get into Lent to remind us that the one transfigured was also the one crucified, was also the one risen. But even knowing and realizing that fine but important theological point does not make this story any less funky, does it? Our first inclination is to try and crack the mystery to figure out the meaning of what happened, to break it down into something that we understand. You know, though, we cannot always figure out mystery, can we? Sometimes the best thing to do with mystery is just to be in the presence of it without trying to do anything. Sometimes maybe our first mode of action should be to try and make ourselves the anti-feeder. I'm usually real good at being Peter. This is not one of the times that we should do that. Our first instinct is to try to tame something that we can't understand. In this case, to try and make the transfiguration manageable. We are prone to continue our same old pattern behaviors, even when holiness is breaking in on us. We want Jesus to be our Jesus, don't we? The one that we think we already know, the one who fits neatly into a booth that we are able to manage. When this is the way that we approach the transfiguration though, it lets all the air out of the tires and we can write this off as just some curious story. Nothing changes, nothing happens, and we get to keep rocking along, living the same predictable way with the same predictable faith. But what if, what if we decided just to be in the presence of the glory of this day? What if we decided, instead of trying to manage the transfiguration, to let the holiness of God transform what we believe to be manageable? What if we did away with that cautious distance that we usually keep between ourselves and God? What if, to borrow a phrase from Peter, we let the dark places inside of ourselves be lit up with the glory from this day. What if we decided not to see what we could make of this story, but to see instead what this story might make of us? What if we'd be scared to death? The letter to the Hebrews comes right out and says it. It says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, that's Hebrews 10, 11. Real encounters with God can be deeply moving, but they can be as threatening and fearful as they can be life transforming. Jesus revealed himself to the disciples on the mountaintop that day 
But he also did something more. He demanded that they follow him, that they walk the same path that he walks. No wonder the disciples fell to the ground. And no wonder Jesus tells them to get up and not be afraid. There's a lot of research out there right now that tells us that Americans are on a spiritual search. But the research shows that they're not really interested in being involved with a church and walking the walk of discipleship alongside others. As they're not as interested in that as they are in seeking the solitary spiritual high. Maybe they're on to something. It's a lot more pleasant and a lot less demanding to seek God as an individual in a way that we can shape and form it as we see fit than it is to give oneself over to be formed instead in a way over which they have no control. It's like the writer Annie Dillard says. She says, if we had the foggiest idea of what power we invoke when we worship and pray to God, we'd be wearing crash helmets. <laughs> Why is it that more people aren't here this morning? Well, you know all the standard reasons, right? Some people will say they can't sing all those old hymns. Some will say that they don't like singing those new hymns either. Some will say they don't, uh, don't like going to church on Zoom. And some people, I'm glad, enjoy going to church on Zoom. Some might say they would be unfriendly. I'm not sure what drug they're on because they don't know this congregation. <laughs> but uh, they're going to say that anyway. Or they're going to say that we use a bunch of strange words like transfiguration or that we do odd things together like light a candle and have bread and juice together. They don't get it that being a disciple of Christ takes a long time, even a lifetime of training and discipline and formation. I suggest though that lots of people avoid church, not because they misunderstand what church is all about, but I think they understand all too well. Church is about God. Church is about the possibility of an encounter with the risen Christ, sometimes threatening, but always life-changing. Church is about seeing God's way and God's will in the world, and then having to say yes or no in walking that way. Church is about all that. And knowing that scares a lot of people to death. But look at you. You all have gathered here today, in person or virtually, because you have encountered Jesus and you have some of that healthy fear in your life. Jesus has appeared to you in all of his radiant glory. He has told you to rise and follow him and he's promised to be with you every step of the way, no matter what the journey holds, and you follow. Mm -hmm. And so, given that, you must be ready for a little transfiguration. Where are the places in your life as individuals, but also as a congregation, where we are more interested in making memorials, but God would come in and blow the fresh wind of the Spirit? What would happen if we held tight to all those promises that Jesus has made to us while we air out the house and let God's wind blow where it will? Friends, Jesus is challenging you and me and all of us this day to put that fear behind us, to take those things which we consider to be manageable and stop managing them so that God can transfigure them. It is a risky proposition to be sure. Nobody's promised us otherwise. But we are promised that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of Holy Spirit, that we will be given all the courage and strength that we need. Let's give it a try. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you're curious, that quote from Annie Dillard came from her book called Teaching a Stone to Talk. Thank <laughs> you. 
friends, if you'll join me, let us together now say the affirmation of faith is taken from the Belhar Confession. Mm -hmm. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints all from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. That through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain, that this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people and groups is sin which Christ has already conquered, and accordingly that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted that this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways. Sorry. Here we go. In that we love one another, that we experience, practice and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be a benefit and blessing to one another, that we share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one body. Oh, one mind. And one mind, amen. One mind. God is the giver of life and the resources therein. Let us now dedicate our lives and resources to the God in whom we live and move and have our being. We invite you to send your offerings in the mail to our church, or you may donate them online to our website. Those who are gathered here at Wilshire are invited to come up and touch the basket as a sign of your dedication to God. Now let us together sing the doxology as we dedicate our offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures hear me alone. Praise God, all of the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, I just used my hand sanitizer, so I hope it's okay for me to break the bread. Okay? All right. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west and from north and south to sit together at table in God's kingdom. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized it. Friends, this is not a table that belongs to New Covenant or Genesis or Mission Presbytery or any Presbyterian that you know. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Also also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. <laughs> God of Moses and Elijah, you come to us in a whirlwind of mystery, a swirling tempest, a devouring fire. Yet you come to us, speaking faithfulness and mercy, shining light in our darkness, offering forgiveness for our sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shining at the dawn of creation, <laughs> shining in our hearts this day with a splendor that overshadows all the beauty of heaven and earth. In his face we have seen your glory. 
Through his words, we have heard your truth. By his living and dying and rising, we have come to know the height and breadth and depth of your great love. With thanksgiving, we remember the bread of life, taken, blessed, broken, and given, that we might be holy and whole. With thanksgiving, we remember the cup of salvation, your new covenant of grace, poured out in love for the world. Remembering your faithfulness and mercy as we share this bread and cup, we offer ourselves in your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now let us share in your Holy Spirit poured out in this place for we, your people, upon this bread and cup. In your spirit, make us one people, one in the promise of Moses, one in the prophecy of Elijah, one in the body of Christ as we seek to proclaim the good news. Let our lives shine with Christ's light, a blessing of joy to the living, a beacon of hope to the dying, a sign of your new creation. All this we pray to you, O God, through the gift of your spirit and in the grace of your word, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. On the night in which Jesus took bread, after he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the remission of sin. As often as you drink this cup, do so remembering me. For every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, these are God's holy things, and you are God's holy people. Come and take your fill. Okay. Commercial break. Christ's body broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Yeah. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for feeding us lavishly and well around this table. Help us to be strengthened by this meal and strengthened by the company of each other, that we may go from here to sing your praise and to live your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> It is time for prayer. Have you finished recording? We have finished recording, and it is time for prayer and praise. This is this is the moment, not the not the moment. These are the moments, and um, I, I take really to prayer and praise a passage. Of